individually share here about what we think happened that created uh, the military remote viewing program. And each of us, uh, as eyewitnesses, saw this from different perspectives. So Russell's going to take a look at it from uh, the idea of what happened from the SRI standpoint and how uh, it evolved into the Stargate uh, military program. Uh, Mel Riley is going to comment on the pre-1977 General Thompson interest in remote viewing and how that was stirred up. And I'm going to carry it from 77. And Paul, who has attempted to research and look at these things, then is going to try to fill in the blanks from him looking across a wide number of sources. So we're going to have um, kind of an interesting anomaly. And we all understand that none of us speaks the total truth. And that, like any eyewitness testimony of, uh, was it the red car that caused the accident or was it the blue car that caused the accident? Um, we're going to play with that for a little while, and we thought it was important to do. So I'm going to give this to Russell. This came out of a discussion one evening that when I got together with Skip, and we were reminiscing about the government remote viewing program, and it was clear that we had significantly different descriptions of what actually happened. What we could be sure of is what our individual participation was. So I have a slightly different proposal for what we do here. And rather than doing it sequentially, I view it as kind of a Dutch auction where I will start talking about early dates. And when I get to a date where you have something to contribute, I will just stop right there. So see if we can put the thing in chronological order rather than my giving my truth from start to finish, which will probably be flawed. But I will get up to 19... 77 and say something happened and then you'll say wait a minute that I, I was there that's not what happened what, what what do you think of that rather than having four recitations I well the other opinion would be to uh, <laughs> um, apparently they only have one wireless microphone for us to pass around uh, are you comfortable with using the wired microphone as well down here can you deal with that back there Okay, so Mel, can you pick the wired microphone up there? I think that's a good idea. Um, so that means that we that sit here have to chime in. And there'll be a point at time when you left the program then that it will be someone else's chance to say, well, Russell left the program at this point, and then this is what was going on. And then when I retired from the Army, Paul will have to pick it up and tell us what happened. That, that sounds fine. So I would say that in the beginning, there was Upton Sinclair and mental radio. In 1929, Upton Sinclair wrote a book about mental telepathy experiments with his very psychic wife, Mary Craig, where Sinclair would sit in one part of the house and Mary Craig would draw often picture-perfect renditions of what Sinclair was drawing in another part of the house. And this is published in Mental Radio initially in 1929 and has now been reprinted by Hampton Rhodes with an introduction by Albert Einstein who observed the experiments and thought that they were important. The next recorded document that I think is important is a book called Mind to Mind by René Warcollier in the 1940s. He was a French chemist who wrote a book in which he described the elements of mental noise that greatly influenced Ingo Swann. And in <clears throat> Mind to Mind, Warcollier already recognized that we have the possibility of experiencing what's going on in distant places and making pictures of those distant places. And that perception is interfered with by our imagination, our analysis, our memories, and our guesses. So René Walcollier, already by 1940, urged us to describe our mental pictures, shapes, and forms, rather than name them. And a very comprehensive description 
of the phenomenology of remote viewing solidly put down in 1940 or 41. With regard to the per current program, my participation started in uh, early 1972, or to put a marker in, Hal Putoff was already at SRI in 1972. Hal's a laser physicist who was at SRI doing laser work and interested in exploring psychic abilities, had a small grant from Bill Church, from Church's Fried Chicken, and in the early part of 1972, was doing experiments at SRI with uh, Ingo Swan, as I understand it. So this is, the, this is one of the cases where I am describing what I understand to be the case, and we'd like Hal to say, no, that's not actually what happened, but it's, that's something like what happened. Well, because, well, go ahead. I've talked to Hal about this fairly extensively, and in fact, that is what happened. So <laughs> in April of 1972, I went to a lecture that Hal Putoff gave at Stanford University on what do we know about psychic abilities. And since I had been traveling around uh, giving a very similar talk, I felt I should see what this other laser physicist has to say on the same subject. So that's the first time that I met Hal at Stanford in 1972, even though we were both born in Chicago and we both had as our first job building high power microwave tubes for the Sperry Gyroscope Company we had never met before. But that's another interesting story. And then we both left the East Coast to come to California to work on lasers, and we had never met. But finally we met in April of 1972 at this talk that Hal gave, and I expressed interest in working on his program, but of course he didn't have any money. Shortly after that, I gave a lecture at Grace Cathedral, as a, I don't know how great to, Mike Murphy was supposed to lecture at Grace Cathedral and couldn't do it. So he asked me to talk at Grace Cathedral. This is April of 72. I met a man named Art Reitz, who was a administrator, a senior administrator at NASA. He liked my ESP talk and invited me to a conference on speculative technology on St. Simon's Island. This is NASA's thought about what shall we do in the next decades. And everyone there was talking about uh, communications, computers, spacecraft, and I was talking about ESP because that interested Art Reitz and the organizer who was George Pesdertz, who became our great benefactor. So at this conference in May of 1972, St. Simon's Island, I had a chance to talk about experiments that I did with a ESP teaching machine and meet with uh, George Pesdertz, who is the administrator for new projects. Uh, Werner von Braun was there. Jo Jim Fletcher, who is the administrator of all of NASA, and Arthur Clark. So out on a pier, we had a conference. One cold day, I was out there freezing on the pier, but I had the attention of Von Braun, George Pesdertz, Jim Fletcher, and who and whoever else, and the and the other guy, where are they? Werner von Braun, and I said that I think we could do experiments to. I'm making this all up at the time. I said I think that we could. I have evidence that we can teach people to do psychic stuff from my four choice trainer. I bet. I imagine that we could help astronauts get in touch with their spacecraft so they could sense accidents, is what I made up. And I said, not only that, but I bet that we could do experiments where you flash lights in the eyes of one person and another person far away could see those lights. And I made that up just by the experiments of, that had been done uh, in the previous decades with uh, st stimulation Entrainment, he, he Walter, w. Gray Walter. 
And they thought that made sense. And oh, the other guy who was there was Edgar Mitchell. And Edgar Mitchell thought this was all very interesting. And what happened in the next month is Edgar Mitchell came to California with me and he and I proposed to Hal Putoff, Charlie Anderson, the administrator of SRI, and our great benefactor, Willis Harmon, that we could do research in a scientific way. Hal and I were laser physicists, and we promised that we would do this work under the scrutiny of the oversight board that they would create, and that we would not embarrass the institute. And we did all of the things that we promised, except for the last one. <laughs> so, um, in September of that year, I joined HAL. We had overhead money from SRI to look for new money. And about that time, Uri Geller showed up. We're still in 1972. And I knew Andrea Poharic for many years, uh, pioneer, ESP researcher, physician. And Andrea called me and said that he had this amazing Israeli psychic, Uri Geller, and Hal and I thought that it would be interesting to bring Geller to SRI. This is in September of 1972. Now, Hal and I had both worked for the CIA in, in different capacities. I had done laser stuff for the CIA. So I had actually met Kit Green, and Hal knew Kit Green, I believe, from other contacts. So I called Kit Green. I usually got to deal with the CIA and the government over silly things, and Hal did operational things. Russell, you might want to explain who Kit Green is. Kit Green is a physician who works for, the, used to work for the CIA, and was one of our great benefactors at CIA during the courses program. Very, very intelligent, helpful um, person who put a lots of fires in our behalf. So we had a visit from Kit Green and a CIA operative named Tony, <clears throat> Tony Marino, who was a laser guy who knew me. And they thought that they would give us a small amount of money to investigate Uri Geller. This is 1972. So we started a little program, and we imported Geller and did now famous experiments where he was supposed to bend metal, and that never happened, but he was very successful at describing hidden pictures. In the spring of the next year, 1973, we were working with Ingo Swan, who was still at SRI. Uh, by that time, Swan had taught us about coordinate remote viewing, and we had a project called ScanAid. Ingo's name, just scanning by coordinates. Ingo was very bored with describing little objects that were hidden away. He said, if I want to see a hidden object, I'll open the door, tear open the envelope. If you don't get me something interesting to do, I'm going to leave. These little objects is a trivialization of my ability, said Swan. So he invented remote viewing, as far as I'm concerned, particularly with regard to outdoor geographical targets and gave us the protocol for the way we've done it subsequently. So in 83, we had Ingo Swan and Pat Price with us. 73. And we did a series of experiments with Pat Price describing outdoor geographical targets that were very, very successful. Formal study where Price did, where we did nine trials, Price described them accurately enough so that seven out of nine were first place matched in a double blind fashion, odds of 100,000 to one. And we took these interesting pictures, Hal Putoff and I, to CIA, then looking for serious money. And with the help of Kit Green, uh, we first passed through the office of the notorious Sid Gottlieb, who was then in charge of something called LSD, which is the Life Science Division, 
mainly. Gottlieb was the godfather of the MK Ultra, as mind control, control with a K, to give you the direction they were going. Uh, and we briefed Gottlieb, and he thought that was interesting. And we eventually got to brief the very courageous, um, eventually we got to brief John McMahon. We, we did m brief McMahon's deputy, whose name was LeMessure, who explained to us that he turns down everything that ever comes across his office, including us, and that way he's right 90% of the time. <laughs> but Kick Green di did help us in 73 to brief John McMahon, who said that we're wasting our time looking at churches and swimming pools in Palo Alto. He is a place that really needs a description. So at the end of 73, we did a formal study where Ken Kress from CIA came to visit SRI with geographical coordinates. And I sat in a shielded room with Price as he described the now famous Crane in Semipalatinsk, and then looked inside the building there and described uh, a large steel sphere under construction, which was probably part of a weapon system to shoot down the satellites that were taking the pictures we were looking at. So that would take us through our early experiments with Pat Price, end of 73, Hella Hammett joined our program perhaps at the end of 73 or 74 because we were looking for control subjects. Thus far, we'd worked with Ingo Swan and Pat Price, who are famous psychics. Hella had never done this before and turned out to be the most reliable psychic we ever had on the program, even though she was brought in as a control. Now, uh, at what point did we, and then, and then a miracle occurred, and we found ourselves at Fort Meade interviewing about 30 Army intelligence people. Well, we, hit, we spent a lot of time in the Pentagon looking for money. All researchers beg for money as about a third of their occupation. And we spoke to... General Thompson, we had huge assistance from an action officer named Bill Stoner, who really carried the day by running around the Pentagon continuously for many months to keep things moving. Uh, we had help from Walter LaBerge, who was the Under Secretary of Defense, who came to SRI and did a remote viewing himself, which he found quite compelling. Around that time, with the help of LaBerge, Walter LaBerge, uh, we began to get involved with INSCOM, and I am a little fuzzy as to how the association with the Army occurred at that time. You've skipped a bit of a gap here. I mean, you've got a gap here. Um, in 74, you, were, that's, you talked about having Hella Hamid in there. Uh, there are some things that, of course, I wasn't there, so I don't want on, but I do know that a very significant event occurred in 75, and that was the loss of CIA funding. The CIA, at that point, the MK Ultra became public knowledge. Gottlieb got in trouble. Uh, the CIA in, CIA in general got in trouble, the church committee, uh, all of that, and uh, there were orders given to clean house, get rid of anything that might be embarrassing or troublesome, and one of the things that got jettisoned was remote viewing as I understand it. Um, of course, it wasn't completely because of the potential embarrassment that remote viewing would cause. Ken Kress wrote an article recently, actually wrote it a long time ago, published in Studies of Intelligence, just recently declassified, in which he said there were actually two factions at the CIA, one faction that supported remote viewing, one faction that was uh, quite adamant against it, and that uh, because of the mixed opinions and some of the mixed results, Admittedly, not all the results were all that spectacular. Um, and along with the, the problems the CIA was facing, it was decided to cut the funding. Uh, do you want to elaborate any more on that, Russell? That's right. As we were losing our CIA funding, we got an unsolicited phone call from Dale Graff at Air Force Foreign Technology, 
who had been following our work all along, and Dale came to us and said, would you like to continue this work for the Air Force as a way for us to continue to evaluate what the Russians are doing, and we could basically press on in the kind of remote viewing we had been doing with Ingo and Pat and Hella. So Dale became our benefactor with the Air Force, and I could say at, the, at this point that Dale followed us through to his retirement when he eventually went to work for DIA and further supported the work after the Air Force let us go. So we, so we think that Dale appeared in 1974, 74, 75. Jack Corona, what's the name Jack Corona in terms of time when he first became a supporter? Jack Corona was a director of DIA, and he was a supporter in that, in that time period. Does Dale eventually worked for Jack Verona? And I'm not sure when DIA took over coordination of the work. We were working for the air. There was a period when we were working for a number of people simultaneously. We had a program at Aberdeen Proving Ground, which was really separate from the Fort Meade program, run by a woman whose name I've forgotten. Uh approximation of what occurred, the Air Force took over funding based largely on Dale and his immediate supervisor's recommendation and supported SRI, but also recruit, they recruited, for example, Aberdeen, I think uh, ARPA, <coughs> excuse me, ARPA may have had a little piece of that pie. Now, ARPA uh, was our enemy. George Lawrence uh, spent a lot of time, George Lawrence was a psychologist, truly one of the men in black. He always <laughs> wore black. His office was draped in black from top to bottom. Yeah. And he made it certain that we would never get any funding from ARPA. That, that's actually uh, true, and I misspoke here. In fact, Lawrence showed up in 73 when you do, were doing your experiments with Ori Geller and uh, basically gave a bad review to the people he was representing. At the time, uh, I think there was some consideration of an ARPA contract, but then that was rejected largely because of Lawrence's input. The interesting thing about Lawrence is he turns up again as the advisor on the NRC study in 1984 through 87, um, and so apparently uh, he cont contributed his biases to that report as well. The Psychops already existed, brought to life by Uri Geller, and the Psychops funded Ray Hyman to go to ARPA to brief ARPA about how bad our research was. So it was a liaison between Hyman going out of his way to run around ARPA with George Lawrence that prevented us from getting ARPA funding that we would otherwise have gotten. Why uh, ARPA is the Advanced Research Project Projects Agency. Agency. Yes, indeed. If we say anything incoherent here, please interrupt us because, as you can see, we're trying to figure out what the truth is. <laughs> And we're grateful for any other suggestions. ARPA did get involved again, though, during the Air Force era. And there was some move, I don't know what role Lawrence played at that point, but there was some move to get actually a contract with ARPA, and it was looked on favorably, but it never went through. And, and so I misspoke in saying that ARPA funded it. There was some attempt to get ARPA to fund it, and it never happened. But there was kind of a cocktail of agencies supporting the, but the Air Force the, was the primary leader there. The Air Force, Drop them like a hot potato as well. Do you, do you know the the occasion for that? I, I can go on with it unless you want. I don't know. Okay. I know the Air Force dropped it, but the money was not lost. It was caught in the air and brought to DIA. Yeah. Sounds like the government at work, doesn't it? <laughs> now, what happened was again, Dale Graff was the focal point for the Air Force's involvement in D, in uh, in supporting SRI in their research. And Dale had actually been awarded an award by the CIA. It was a, a, I don't remember the exact title, but it was an Outstanding Intelligence Analysis Award. It was a, it was a uh, interagency award. The CIA, of course, is the highest intelligence agency, supervises the others, and this was a, a director of CIA award. And Dale was chosen, and I don't know the exact time frame, it was like 78 maybe, 77, 78, maybe 79. The chief of staff at the Air Force at the time 
Lou Allen, I think his name was. Lou Allen had a real negative attitude towards remote viewing, and I'll tell you why in a moment. And declined the award on behalf of Dale Graff so that he was not given that award. Part of the award, it was, it was, an, it was a fellowship where you were given a year's leave of absence from the agency that you worked for. You were allowed to study any aspect of intelligence collection or intelligence analysis that you wanted to. Dale had chosen to study uh, the involvement of Psy in intelligence collection. And Lou Allen, because of his prejudice here, denied the award, did not allow Dale to accept it, and of course he did not, was not able to, to do that. Now there's a reason why Allen did that. And that was because he was a major supporter of the MX missile basing plan. If some of the, you remember this, they had the, uh, the shuttle idea, you know, where he had the, the shelters all throughout Nevada, our state here, in Utah, and they were going to shuttle these missiles around so the Soviets wouldn't be able to figure out where they were. For many reasons, it's a really stupid idea. But there were very strong supporters because they wanted to push this thing through, well, because of the way the military works. In our search for support, we proposed to demonstrate that that wouldn't work and we actually carried out that demonstration. As we told, foolishly, we picked the Air Force to support this program, which we, actu which we actually did. And we said that you pretend that you will hide your missile at some base numbered from one to 10. You choose the base. We will then assign, this is, this, I'd never thought of this before. This is like an early associated remote viewing and I'd never thought of it in this context, he said, we, you hide your pretend missile at a base numbered one to 10. We will assign a local Palo Alto Bay Area outdoor site to the numbers one to 10. At the end of this whole thing, we will tell you the number corresponding to the site we describe, and you will then tell us the correct number. So from the interviewer point of view, I turned to Pat Price, or Hella, I think, and said, this is an ordinary remote viewing experiment. Describe the place that we're gonna take you to. The place we're gonna take you to was determined by the site that the Air Force had decided to hide their missile. Everybody understand what we're doing? We did the experiment, described the site, and got the right number. And then something happened. What happened was Lou Allen loved the MX. And when that report got sent up to the Pentagon and passed around, all kinds of people were saying, well, if our remote viewers can do that, why can't the Russian remote viewers do that? And it threatened General Allen's agenda here with the MX missile. Now I'm getting this third hand. I can't say this is absolutely exactly how it happened, but the story is that he took that report he locked it in a safe and he forbade anyone in his staff to mention it again. So when Dale, not realizing the politics that were occurring here, was chosen for the award and stated what he wanted to do, the chief of staff of the Air Force, the supreme guy in the Air Force, already had definite negative opinions about this whole process because he saw it as undermining what he wanted to do. So Dale ran into this stone wall he could feel the heat growing in his job, and he said, I don't need this. Well, just about this time, Jack Verona made him an offer. said, hey, why don't you come work for me? I want to set up a program at DIA. You come over here, you can be the action officer, and we'll go from there. And, you know, things were getting hot for Dale at the Air Force, so he moved on. And then, then history proceeded from there. And we always bubble up to the top of the agencies. Hal had worked for NSA, and he had a very cool idea with one of his other buddies at NSA, he said, why don't we read some of the NSA encrypted traffic? In fact, what Hal proposed is, why don't you encrypt a paragraph containing a message in your very, very best unbreakable cipher and just seal that into an opaque envelope and then seal the envelope with foil and seal the foil with lead so you know for a fact we can't get into this envelope and we will then tell you the substance of the material contained in the paragraph. Doesn't that sound like a good remote viewing experiment? <laughs> well, that bubbled and, and we were going to do that because we had a contract proposed to do that 
and that bubbled up all the way to the Bobby Inman level, who said, holy shit, I don't even want to know that that works. <laughs> and, and that whole NSA effort got canceled just because they didn't, it's like the MX thing, where they said they didn't even want to confront the idea that their most secure cipher could be read by a psychic. I think this might be a good time. Well, Stephen wants to ask a question. We probably want to keep questions to a minimum, but we'll let Stephen ask it. Oh, Stephen's going to add. So, you want the mic? Uh, at about this time, Bobby Inman was the chief, was the, oh, oh, Stephen Schwartz, there I am. If I, if I have the timing right, Russell, it was uh, shortly before this when Bobby Inman was the uh, executive assistant to the DCNO, the deputy chief of naval operations, that I was having, completely knowing nothing of this, was having all this psyche, including your stuff, was coming across my desk because everybody in the Navy knew that I had an interest in the psychic and Inman and I had lunch in the secretary's mess and said, he asked me, do you think it might be possible that there actually is anything to this remote viewing stuff? And I think it was the, that was the first time I ever heard the word remote viewing and I said, well, I don't, if you're talking about the, the program that I think you're talking about, I don't know, but let me tell you about what's being done, what has been done in other areas, completely independent of this, the archeological stuff that I had come out of. He took a number of notes and said, oh, well, that makes me think this through in a very different way, and that's the last I ever heard of it until now when you bring this up. Thank you. This might be a good time actually to to go to the Fort Me, because it was about this time that events were unfolding on the other side of the continent concerning this. But first, I want to point something out. The, the history of this gets confusing because people are used to having a single chain or chronology going up through you know, any historical moment. There were actually several stories involved here. There was always a program at SRI followed by SRSAIC. That was one trajectory. But there came a certain point when an operational Well, SAIC program, didn't enter the picture until right. 1984, perhaps. So a lot of things, the whole army participate, that I think SAIC will surface, but, but, but not yeah. for several more years. I was years. just giving you an overall picture here. Uh, it started at SRI. Eventually, it moved to SAIC roughly about 89 under Ed May. But parallel to that was the military, the operational involvement in this. Now that didn't start as early as the SRI stuff, but it started, as Skip will tell you in a moment, in 1977. And that was a parallel history. And it's easy to confuse those two, but you gotta remember there's a separation there. There was some cross-pollination. There were times when there wasn't. It wasn't a particularly happy relationship in some circumstances, but they, they were related and they did have interaction. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and move over to the military stuff. The, the first, the, we had this interaction with uh, Walt LaBerge and General Thompson, and we had a small program that started at Aberdeen, and I don't remember what all happened there, but the next, so in my confused memory, Aberdeen is, we met Harris Walker, who was at Aberdeen fine physicist interested in psychic stuff. And the next army memory I have is that we met uh, Captain Atwater, who was inviting, uh, I think he came to SRI and invited us to interview some number of army intelligence officers, not at Aberdeen, but at Fort Meade. Did something like that occur? Um. Yes, uh, the Ab we went to Aberdeen a couple times ourselves to find out what was going on. There was a small amount of funding that was coming out of Aberdeen. Aberdeen Proving Grounds uh, had to do with weapon systems and testing weapon systems, and so they were obviously interested in Soviet weapon systems, and could remote viewing 
uh, be used to see how effective the Soviet cannon was versus the American cannon, for example. And there was some funding that came out of Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Um, the little story that I'm going to tell uh, is seen through another lens, looking back at the US government seeing themselves using the civilian research effort in support of intelligence, as opposed to Russell's perspective of them seeing their activity generating interest by the government. So it's a different kind of a concept. Um, as I talked a little bit about in my talk, I became interested in this because I was teaching at the intelligence school. I had had about 10 years as a counterintelligence specialist protecting our systems from the invading eye of the Cold War enemies and stumbled across uh, Russenhaus' book, Mind Reach. Can I say a word about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to mention, we, we had pub our, we, we made a deal with the devil. Uh, Hal and I were researchers, and researchers are constantly looking for money, and we thought that we, although CIA was not our favorite people to work for, for a number of reasons that you can all imagine, we felt that as young scientists looking out at the Cold War, that basically we were in favor of intelligence as compared with ignorance. So we felt that it would be helpful. We had just gone through, for example, the uh, Six Day War in Israel, which was a, a, a big surprise to the Israelis. And so it was 73, 73 war. So it was clear to us that having information would be valuable to the country rather than being surprised by some inadvertency. So we approached our friends of the CIA that we had known before, and the deal we made is that if you support us, the most classified thing that we would know and not reveal is that the CIA was supporting us. That was a top secret piece of information, surprisingly. However, the CIA agreed that we could publish the non-operational and therefore, non-class, we made an agreement. It could have, it eventually went the other way and I left SRI. But uh, for most, up until 82, we were able to publish the scientific seeming parts of what we were doing. So Hal Putoff and I in 1974 published our first paper in Nature Magazine, which is a prestigious English magazine read worldwide. And that paper was about remote viewing with Pat Price, brainwave studies with Hella Hammond, and picture drawing experiments with Uri Geller. So this was a potpourri of psychic stuff at SRI, and it was quite amazing that Nature agreed to publish all of that, three different very amazing ESP things. In 1976, Hal and I wrote quite a lengthy paper for the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical Engineering Society, we wrote a paper that sounded just like an engineering paper called Information Transmission Over Kilometer Distance. And after a lot of adventures, uh, IEEE agreed to publish that paper. I, I would say in a word, we showed the editor of the IEEE, who was a manager at Bell Labs, we showed him how to do remote viewing. He went back to Murray Hill, did five perfectly correct remote viewing people experiments with people in his lab, and published the paper over the great opposition of a number of reviewers. A courageous man who said, this looks like data. People tell me what to do. I did what they said, and it works. Let's publish the paper. The vice president of Hewlett Packard, a distinguished researcher, founder of SETI, Search for Intelligence Life, somewhere. Uh, Barney Oliver read our paper and just wrote on it, this is the kind of thing I wouldn't agree to even if it was true. So we published uh, our first paper in Nature, talking about remote viewing and Uri Geller in 74. 76, we published this lengthy review article, Everything We Knew About Remote Viewing, 
in 76. And then in 1977, we wrote a pretty comprehensive book describing all of this work, Pat Price, Ingo Swan, Hella Hammett in 1977. And that was a book Hella put up and I wrote called Mind Reach, which is what Skip came across. And discovering the IEEE paper and the mind reach document as a counterintelligence agent, I became curious that we weren't protecting ourselves against what I perceived as a real threat to security. Uh, it was sort of interesting because then I had learned about satellites and taking pictures and tapping telephones and sneaking in late at night and stealing documents and everything, but nobody was doing anything about this concept of remote viewing. And I was totally ignorant of any of the government work going on in the early 70s, because here we're in mid-late 70s here, until I got to Fort Meade and got onto a very interesting team of investigators that uh, attempted to uh, attack our organizations with all platforms, all kinds of intelligence tools to attack our own U.S. installations so that we could compare what our Cold War enemies might do if they were doing that uh, one fateful day, I was assigned to my own office as a, a young lieutenant, and it uh, was the office of the previous owner of that office was a Lieutenant Colonel Scottsko. And when I sat down at the desk and opened the drawers, they were empty and so forth, went over to the safe, pulled open the safe drawers, they were empty files until I pulled open the bottom drawer, and there were classified documents about how the government had been working with Russell Targ and Hal Putoff on various and sundry projects and remote viewing. And this Scanate document was in that drawer. It was in the fifth drawer of a safe in an office in Fort Meade. Now, I'd like to then ask Mel to comment on Fort Meade is INSCOM at this point in time. Uh, in, INSCOM came about shortly after USENTA. Does that explain it to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, INSCOM is the Army Intelligence uh, Unit at that time. They change their names every now and then, and these are just acronyms. Army Intelligence. I was an Army officer, and I walk into this office. A brand new lieutenant gets his own office. Oh boy. And I open the bottom drawer and find in Lieutenant Colonel Scottsko's old safe are these classified documents. And before I go on with what I did then, we have to know how did those documents get in that safe, and that's Mel Riley. So this is 1977, 78? Yes. Ni yes. 1977, yeah. Uh, I'll try to make a brief my background on how I got to this highly specialized unit, SED. Uh, oh, thank you. OK. He knows no. his own name. No, I'm, I'm Mel Riley. I'm sorry. Uh, At one point in my career, I was an imagery interpreter, which means I look at aerial photographs and I find things. But I went beyond that, and I was volunteered for a special program uh, that came about because even though we had the satellites in those days, and we had SR-71s, and you all remember 1960 with Gary Powers and his U-2, about six months out of the year, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union is cloud covered. Well, it was an Air Force program, and they had a program that would go in under the clouds and fly a treetop level and take aerial photographs. But they couldn't find enough Air Force people stupid enough to volunteer for this program. <laughs> but because I had the same type of experience and knew all this stuff, I volunteered. Me being in the Army, I'm a crazy guy. Uh, I think it was General Thompson who described successful remote viewers. General Thompson. I know who he was. <laughs> but we're backing up. He wasn't there yet. General Allen was there. Not the Air Force General No, 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 no. This is before, yeah, we'll progress up. I know you mean well. Um, no, I, and, and so somehow, I became very successful at finding targets of opportunity, things that military intelligence was looking for, they didn't know where it was, uh, and somehow I would find it. 
How did you do that? I don't know. <laughs> at, at the time, I didn't, I, I didn't become a remote viewer until later. Um, but I, I just had a knack of doing this. And uh, not only that, when we got the film back and got it developed, I could find things on that film that nobody else could see. But when they actually took a real good look at it, yes, it was there. And uh, General Thompson, and he comes in later into the picture, but he was on the, uh, the uh, documentary, The Real X-Files, that BBC shot, and it aired on Discovery Channel. And he describes successful remote viewers as risk takers. Hello, I volunteer for that stupid <laughs> program. Uh, artists, and I do, I do have a talent for art. And he said, especially photo interpreters, okay? Successful photo interpreters. Uh, and that's my background in that area. Well, the unit that uh, Skip was talking about, the special unit, SED, uh, Systems Exploitation Division, was being formed by an outfit that became USANTA. Uh, in 1976, I was selected by a colonel who was involved in putting USANTA and SED together, and he had personal knowledge of my activities and successes and, and so on when I was in Europe flying these missions. So he said, well, this, this unit was, get, was out to get the cream of the crop, the best of the best, and that's how all us remote viewers got there eventually. <laughs> I mean, look at, look at the panel, look at Lynn, and you know, Lynn's sitting down there grinning, but it's true. Well, I was trying to separate out two things that you were doing, which you didn't really separate out. Uh, one of the things, you volunteered for this treetop flying, is that right? Yes. And you were also a demon photo interpreter. Now, well, that, yeah. that was looking at other people's pictures, is that right? Well, actually, I was going out and taking, er, telling him when to turn the cameras on, when to turn it off. These are pictures. Uh, I, I scheduled the missions. I told them where to go, what to shoot. Uh, they would be developed. They'd come back, and we'd look at them. So you were involved in flying the missions and doing the photo interpretation. Right. But I wasn't the only one doing the interpretation. There, it, I mean, you know, we're talking. We've got a whole office full of people. But uh, somehow I seem to be more successful consistently than a lot of the other people. And the unit that uh, Skip was talking about was formed to use our best assets against our own installations and targets and see how the Soviets could get information from it and then we could correct the problems that we had there. And I was selected as uh, an imagery interpreter to come to that unit. And I'll try to shorten it up a little bit more. Eventually, uh, I was in this office one day, back behind the green door. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, and there was this master sergeant who was very perplexed. He didn't know what to do. And, and I said, what's the problem? He says, well, my boss, Barry Minor, gave me this pile of, of, of information and books and wants me to deal with it, and I, I can't. He said, I don't know what it's all about, and not only that, my religion doesn't allow me to believe in any of this stuff, so where am I going to go with it? And I said, well, I'll help you out. I won't mention the name of the sergeant. I, I mentioned the name of his supervisor. Right, it was, his name, his name was Sergeant Young. Okay. I, I thought it was somebody, some known person. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, no, no. This was all being hidden and under the covers and stuffed in a, in a safe. And because we had problems it. within the CIA who specifically thought we were do, what we were doing was from the devil and gave us bad reviews even on our very best data. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, and that continued throughout the whole project. Uh, anyhow, I had an interest in this stuff, and I actually had a pretty substantial library of, of these type of 
paranormal phenomena and all this other stuff at home. And I would bring it in and share it with him, and he, he still couldn't, I don't want anything to do with it, I don't want anything to do with it, and it disappeared. And didn't hear any more for a while, but then all of a sudden, lo and behold, Skip shows up. And he's interested in the project. Well, Skip doesn't know me from Adam. All he knew was I was one of them grunts, enlisted men. Uh, however, once I found out that Skip was selected to head up a special project called Gondola Wish, was it? Gondola Wish. These code names change all over everything, but there was, there was once a code name called Gondola Wish whatever that means. <laughs> and I'm just about done with my portion. Uh, so, but I... Was, was Scottsco then not involved in this at all? It just wound up by accident in that desk drawer where I found the stuff? I believe so, and that was in the second vault? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it accidentally wound up that, in that vault, and everybody hoped it would die and go away and nobody would ever find it. And that was a good place for it because... This was a huge vault, like a, like a bank vault inside of, of a huge secure area, which was like another bank vault. Uh, that was really a fun place working. But they figured nobody would find it there. <clears throat> well, anyhow, Gondola Wish came to be, and they gave it to Skip. And I was still interested in the project, but I wasn't in the, the hierarchy of the, of the special unit. But I thought... If I could make myself indispensable somehow, maybe I could get in on this project because I knew what was going on. And don't ask me how again, Russ. I didn't know at the time. I just wound up there. <clears throat> but when I found out this was going on, I said, hey, here we go. I'll volunteer for another stupid project that'll get me killed, you know, or ruin my career. And it has on for some people, I believe. Uh, and that's where we're at on that. Well, let me uh, just pick up then what I did with those documents here. Um, I discovered the documents, and it was an amazing sort of serendipitous kind of a thing because back in my previous assignment, back teaching at Fort Huachuca, discovering uh, Mind Reach and the IEEE paper, and then it kind of left my awareness until there they were in the bottom drawer of the safe again, except these were classified documents and there was proof of government involvement in this. And somebody else beside me was thinking about security issues. And I was this brand new young lieutenant who thought, you know, I had an original idea here. But I took these documents to Major Keenan and said, sir, I found these documents in the bottom of the drawer of the safe. What do you want me to do with them? And he said, oh yeah, do you know anything about that? And I said, well, sir, yeah, I do know something about that. And he said, well, you keep them then, and you'll be in charge of that from now on. Like, you know, disappear those things again. <laughs> and I, uh, I began to think about it a lot and read about it a lot and remember and go back and read Russ and Howe's book again and compare them with these classified documents. And it was obvious to me that from the perspective of the intelligence community, they had been commissioning research to be done to validate the Soviet discoveries because there was in fact literature in there about the work the Soviets had been doing and it was obvious that they were contracting with SRI to replicate some of these studies to validate is what the Russians are doing really true? So it looked to me, not knowing anything about any of this that Russ had been involved in since 72, like that was what was going on. And when I went to my boss and said, sir, you know, this really could be a threat, and we've actually been asked by Redstone Arsenal Alabama, they're worried about this, what should we do about this threat? Well, he turned to me, as I explained earlier, and said, okay, Lieutenant, you tell me, what are we gonna do about this threat? And eventually, I suggested to him that we should train some people it seemed logical. Uh, we flew satellites over these people. We bugged their telephones. We intercepted their radio communications. We broke into their offices at night. Why not remote view them, too? But we should probably 
use our own people. We shouldn't hire outside people, and the SRI people were these uh, trained uh, stars, Ingo Swan, Hella, Pat Price. We didn't want these outside people without security clearances. We needed to train our own people. And came back, well, how are you going to do that? And so the question was, how was I going to do that? And that was when I flew out to SRI and, well, actually, I told Major Keenan that before we took that step, we had to find out whether this was really a threat. There's a difference between uh, simply you can do this versus this is a probable threat. And so I began to look on these classified documents. Who wrote this? Where was it published? And I wound up discovering Dale Graff, and I wound up discovering DIA and Jim Sawyer. And Jim Sawyer was the one who, and this is DIA, so after the CI funding window, when DIA had picked up the funding, so it's post-1977 era, Jim Sawyer said to me, the young lieutenant, we are contracting with SRI to replicate the work that we have detected is going on in the Soviet Union to validate their experiments. And so in DIA's mind, that's kind of what I picked up at that moment. I was, I'm happy for Stephen to immediately add something or ask questions. I would ask the audit, we're going through a lot of material. If we say something that sounds incoherent, for example, if you hear me say something and it sounds to you like Skip just said the opposite, hold up your hand and say that doesn't make any sense because that would be helpful to us. It may not make sense. Something, I, this is really quite fascinating. In 1978, having completed the psychic submarine experiment, the remote viewing on the seafloor, Ingo came to me with a grant for Project Compass, which I have a feeling none of you all have ever heard about. Project Compass was a survey of Russian psychotronic parapsychological secret laboratories, and we did that. And and it disappeared. It went back into the great void with Ingo. And then unsolicited, I got a call from the uh, chief of staff of the Army. Would I come up to uh, the Army War College and brief General Gorshin and a selection of folk that he had? So I did, in fact, go up to do that. And they came up to me afterwards and said, would you be interested in being funded to do some additional work? And I said, no, I, I'm not willing to do classified research. And so that's, it never went anywhere. And I never heard another word from Project Compass. But years later, when I was going to Russia, I talked to the Soviet researchers, who you could now talk to, Popov and some others, and uh, Adriankin, and I've forgotten. And they confirmed that the Project Compass information was largely as described. So um, this is the first I've heard about this part of it. I... Where are we? So I go out uh, and meet <laughs> a very strange looking character that meets all the definitions of a mad scientist, Russell Targ. And <laughs> Oh, I did go to Wright Patterson and met Dale Graff, who was just then, just then publishing a wonderful uh, paper on uh, Soviet parapsychology work. Uh, one of the things that was right on the fringe of before they were firing him, he was able to get this thing published, and it was a, a very well done work. Under the concept that these things were valid, here, look what SRI is doing. And that was the kind of proof that I needed to take to Major Keenan to say, this is not just some scientific effort. There is, in fact, a probability that the Soviets are doing this. All the funding is coming from the KGB. Here's this fantastic document. 
But rather than this young lieutenant trying to convince Major Keenan about this, I invited Jim Sawyer to come up from DIA and present Sawyer, Jim Sawyer to come up from DIA and present this to my boss. And so he did. He presented this situation and we shake, shook hands and then we sent Jim Sawyer back to DIA. And we're a little army unit under DIA. And Major Keenan turns to me again and says, okay, Lieutenant, what are you going to do now? I've demonstrated to him sufficient information that this is a probable threat, just like the Soviets probably fly satellites over us. The Soviets probably tap our telephones. The pro Soviets probably recruit agents within our classified facilities. They're probably using remote viewers too. Then I had to go out and see Russ and Hal to find out, how do you train a remote viewer anyways? The, they were authored by the Army Medical Command. One was Controlled Offensive Behavior. They're on the CD. I got them from the Freedom of Information Act. They're all declassified now, and they're on the CD that comes out with my book. Uh, and again, they were trying to change the names to protect the innocent. So instead of saying parapsychology or remote viewing or ESP, the early one was Controlled Offensive Behavior, you know, kind of a thing. But they were uh, early 70s publications. Now, there is an open source document called Psychic's Discoveries behind the uh, Psychic Iron Curtain, uh, Schrodinger and uh, Ostrander and Schroeder. Yeah, previous to that, that time frame.